All right, now it is my pleasure tonight to be able to uh, introduce um, Sandra Tanner coming up to speak to us tonight and telling a little bit about how she journeyed out of Mormonism. Uh, Sandra doesn't know this, but Sandra is one of my uh, heroes. Um, it was her and Gerald and their book, uh, Mormonism, Shadow or Reality, that helped me to understand that Mormonism was false. Uh, and so without Sandra, uh, I wouldn't have known that. And so I'm very grateful for her work. And so with that being said, I'm gonna invite Sandra to come up and share her story. stuff up here. That's okay. Man. Okay. Whoops. That didn't open up to the right place. <laughs> We're off to a great start here. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, for those of you that don't know, um, Mormonism started in 1830. Uh, it was started by Joseph Smith, a young farm boy in western New York. And uh, a few years after he had his movement going, another young man joined Mormonism by the name of Brigham Young. One thing you need to keep in mind is that Mormonism was a young person's movement. We think of it now as a bunch of old guys leading the LDS church. We have to understand when it started, it was like uh, the hippie movement in my generation. It was the young people's rebellion against established churches. They were looking for something new, something different. Uh, they were looking for a restoration of the biblical Christianity. They felt the established churches had gone astray. And so Joseph Smith is a young man in his 20s, founded Mormonism, and I believe wrote the Book of Mormon. Uh, and then uh, a few years after he got it going, another young man, Brigham Young, joined. Brigham Young would later uh, be appointed an apostle in this new church. When Joseph Smith picked his apostles, uh, I think the average age was something like 27 uh, out of all of the early church leaders. So, I mean, it really was a young people's movement. When uh, Joseph Smith uh, took the LDS church to Nauvoo, Illinois, which, I mean, you could spend a year explaining how that all happened, but, um, and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, he was uh, secretly practicing polygamy and publicly lying about it. In fact, he was even lying to his own wife about it. He got his closest followers to go into this with him, and one of those was Brigham Young. And uh, a number of the apostles started taking plural wives there in the 1840s, as well as Joseph Smith. Brigham Young is my great-great-grandfather. My mother's maiden name was Young. My uh, family line goes Brigham Young then, and his legal wife, Marianne Angel, and then Brigham Young had a son, Brigham Young Jr. Uh, you have to understand Brigham Young Jr. was one of 56 children. And uh, I don't know how you remember that many names <laughs> because uh, I have enough trouble keeping three kids' names straight, you know. Uh, my youngest daughter uh, grew up thinking her name was Ape Teresa, because I'd start to say April, and then I'd realize, no, it's Teresa, you know, so I don't know. Uh, so they, uh, Brigham Young Jr. had uh, plural wives as well, and one of his plural wives, uh, Abigail Stevens, was my great-grandma. She was still alive when I was a young girl in uh, up in Tennessee, I think she died when I was about 11. So I grew up knowing my great grandma young. And um, they had a son, Walter, who was my grandpa. I didn't know Walter, he had died uh, before I was born, but I knew Walter's mother. <laughs> of 
Going to see uh, Grandma Young was a, a journey into Mormon polygamous past because she had wonderful stories of how God protects those that follow God's commands and don't bend to the laws of man. And so here Brigham Young Jr. had continued to practice polygamy after the manifesto of the Mormons in 1890 announced that they were going to stop living polygamy at that time so that they could uh, get back their church property. The government had confiscated all church funds uh, trying to force the Mormons to give up polygamy. And uh, they also wanted statehood. And so in order to do that, the trade-off was they had to give up polygamy. Well, theoretically, they did that. However, the top leadership continued to live polygamy after the manifesto. In fact, there's a book called Solemn Covenant that deals with uh, the 1890s and shows that after the manifesto, there were at least 100 to 200 plural marriages, new plural marriages, by top church leadership that uh, went totally contrary to what the public was being told or what people thought was going on, which is what led up to the Reed Smoot hearings in the 1904 time period when uh, Senator Reed Smoot, uh, there was a uh, Senate hearing whether to seat him as a senator from Utah because he was an apostle in the Mormon church. And it was kind of like the Kennedy hearings. I mean, it was a big, long hearing. And uh, finally, uh, the church was able to make it through that whole problem. But through that hearing, it became obvious that polygamy was still being practiced because different people came to the stand and told how that they had been married after the manifesto or that someone in their family had been. Uh, so anyways, all of that is background to my story. <clears throat> My um, folks were married in the Salt Lake Temple and uh, came, both came from very strong Mormon homes. Uh, when I was in uh, grammar school, my mother quit wearing her garments. Now, the reason she gave for that, and I assume most of you know that when the Mormon goes through the temple, they have special undergarments that, uh, that they wear. Back then, a woman's undergarment would have been a one piece um, that went down to the knees, and it was kind of like short long johns. Um, well, the man's was one piece as well. That didn't change until, when was it, in the 70s or 80s when they went to a two piece thing, um, which made it much easier for women to wear slacks. Um, but my mom's excuse for quitting the garments was that she uh, was going deaf and she wore a hearing aid. And back in the um, fort in 1940s, a uh, hearing aid took great big, it was a big battery pack. You know, those old D batteries, <laughs> big battery pack, you know. And she would strap this to her legs and have a wire that came up to a headset uh, that went behind her ears for her to hear. And she said it was too hard to maneuver the, this apparatus with the one-piece garment. I suspect that had she been devout enough, she could have found a way around that. But it made a, a good excuse to get rid of them. And uh, my dad uh, soon followed because there wasn't much point in him wearing the garment when uh, she wasn't wearing it anymore. I was born in Salt Lake City, but shortly... Uh, after my birth, my folks moved to Southern California for defense work for World War II. And uh, so I was raised in California. I was raised in a minority situation. Uh, there are a lot of Mormons now in Southern California, but there weren't back in the uh, 40s. Boy, does that sound like a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to uh, grammar school and uh, the particular school I was in was almost all Protestant girls, or kids. There was a Jewish girl and a Catholic girl. And the Catholic girl was cute. And uh, so then there was me and the Jewish girl. So um, <laughs> we didn't want to hang around with her. <laughs> Kind of mean when I look back on it, but I don't know. Maybe she didn't even miss us. She she had all the attention, anyways. But uh, 
So my best friend was a Jewish girl, because no, uh, th that was the closest fit I had <laughs> in the school for a friend. Well, by the way, because Mormons think they're true Israel, I mean, I really resonated with this girl. I'm true Israel, you know? Uh, <laughs> because that's what you were taught coming up in Mormonism, that uh, in the gathering for the last days, God was pulling back into the church all those of Israelite descent for the end times. And uh, in Mormonism, as a teenager, you, you get a patriarchal blessing, and in it, it declares your lineage and so when I got mine, it declared that I was a descendant of Ephraim. Well, all white Mormons are descendants of Ephraim, as far as I can tell. Uh, it, if you're an Indian, then you're a descendant of Manasseh. Uh, if they know you're Jewish, you'd probably be a descendant of Judah. Uh, I've met a few that had Benjamin or some other tribe listed. But generally speaking, a Mormon's patriarchal blessing will declare that they are the lineage of Ephraim. So to meet a, a, a Jewish girl was you know, wow, we're on the same page, you know. <laughs> okay, so then I get into junior high, and there's a, in eighth grade, this little Christian girl comes up to me, and she says, Sandra, I understand that you're a Mormon. And I said, yes. And she says, tell me what the Mormons believe about God. Uh, now, I'm assuming that she had a Christian home, Something must have been said at her church or her family. Uh, someone must have told her that the Mormons were really screwy, you know. Uh, and she wanted to find out if that was really true. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing because of her coming up, it was so out of the blue for her to come up and ask me that someone had to prep her for why bring this up. So I'm going to think, oh, okay, what do the Mormons believe about God? How do you explain this, you know? And so I remember this wonderful phrase I had grown up hearing. The Mormons don't say it as much now, but when I grew up, this was the go-to phrase. As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. And she looked at me with this horrified expression. <laughs> and she says, Sandra, that's blasphemy. And walked away. <laughs> And, and I'm standing there thinking, you know, around the back, through my mind, oh, sounds good to me. You know. <laughs> I had no clue why someone would be offended at that belief. Now, I do not give this as a suggestion how to witness to your Mormon friends. <laughs> uh, a little gentler might be good, you know, uh, but she didn't give me any clue why it was blasphemy. Now, I think it would have helped if she would have said, Sandra, you that's blasphemy. You need to read the book of Isaiah. Go home and read Isaiah 43, 10, and 11. See, that would have given me somewhere to go. But just to say that's blasphemy and walk away isn't real helpful. Now, God did use it. And this is the thing I want to encourage you with in talking to your Mormon friends. God does use those things we say to those around us, even though we may not have said them the best way. We could, someone else could have done it better. <laughs> uh, we may have forgot the verse, whatever. But I believe as you have opportunity as a Christian to honestly share with the Mormon, you have to trust that God's going to use what you say. And God used that because it bothered me. Uh, I did not take offense at her words because I knew she didn't say it to hurt me. She was just taken back by the concept. So I want to encourage you to say what you can to your Mormon friend, even if they don't listen. I don't know who this girl is. I hope someday in heaven I get to meet her because she started this whole thing and, and I have no clue who she is. I don't think she would remember the conversation. It was such, uh, you know, it was such a small part of her life that she probably doesn't even know. So, but I want to give you that phrase again. As man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. And this is what Judy was alluding to earlier in talking about the Mormons' past, present, and future. That they believe God has a past. That he once was immortal on another earth, got married, went to work, died, resurrected, went to heaven. We don't know how long it takes. Learned to be a God. 
and eventually made the spirits for our world. But the Mormon hope is to do the same thing. When they die and go to heaven, they hope to eventually arrive at the state of becoming a god themselves. So it really is a blasphemous thought, but I just had no clue why. Okay, several things happened while I was in uh, high school. Uh, um, some Christian friends invited me to uh, attend their uh, youth meetings, and I went to some of those. Uh, and to give you a little insight into the Mormon mind, uh, they had prayer at the start of the youth meeting where they would uh, pray for different family requests. Okay, what this did for me as a Mormon was I'm thinking, wow, even these guys believe in prayer. <laughs> because as a Mormon, I grew up thinking we were the only ones that were serious about our faith. All you other guys just went to church for show. Uh, business contacts, impress people with your clothes, whatever. Uh, you know, so, yeah, I can't say that anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> we got so casual, you know. But, uh, I, I, in Mormonism, there is a sort of attitude of um, a superior position of knowledge and of having the gospel that the rest of you just don't quite measure up to. And so I liken it to a child coming out of Sunday school and saying to their parents, Mommy, I love Jesus. And the parents pat the little kid on the head and say, That's wonderful, dear. And, but they're thinking in their mind, Now I hope they just grow up to understand all of the doctrines of Christianity and the Bible and all that, see. And so that's the Mormon's attitude towards you. When you talk about being a Christian, it's as though they spiritually are patting you on the head and saying, well, that's wonderful that you believe in prayer and you talk about Jesus. Now, if you just grow up and get the whole message, you're on the right path, but you aren't there yet, see? So, and that was, I mean, I was one of them. I, that was my, very much my attitude. Well, okay, so then uh, the Jehovah's Witness, uh, we had a couple living next door to us, and uh, they started coming around, and uh, so one summer I studied with them. Not that I was interested in joining, I was just curious to see what they were about, so I met with them. Well, then we started up in the fall in seminary, and we were studying Old Testament, and uh, by now, my mother had started to have serious questions about Mormonism. I didn't know about this at the time, but she and my grandma and one of my aunts had read Fawn Brody's book, No Man Knows My History. And it had started them down a road of investigating early Mormonism, how it had changed through the years and those things. They started going to use bookstores and buying all the old Mormon books they could to make comparisons. And they started to see all sort of problems. But I didn't know this. And uh, so in seminary, we get to the part where we're, we're studying about uh, Moses talked to the Lord face to face. Well, in Mormonism, Elohim and Jehovah are two different gods. They refer to Heavenly Father as Elohim, and Jehovah is Jesus. And so in their minds, that makes two gods. Well, if you look in the Old Testament, you'll see the words uh, Lord God used together, and that's Jehovah Elohim, uh, the Lord my God. But they divide them up into two gods. The Mormons at least uh, when I was going to seminary, used Moses talks to the Lord face to face to try to prove that God the Father had a physical body because of this idea he grew up on another planet, died, went to heaven, and finally got to be a God. He has a resurrected body. And so to prove that, they would use Moses talk to the Lord face to face, God must have a body. Okay, so my mom asked me one day, she says, well, how do they know that's Elohim and not Jehovah? that Moses is talking to. See, remember, because they got them two different people here. Mm, I says, I don't know. And she says, well, when you go to seminary, you ask them how they know <laughs> it's Elohim and not Jehovah. OK, right, so I'm getting set up. And um, <laughs> I, so we get to seminary, and, you know. I have a question. How do we know that was Elohim and not Jehovah? <laughs> and the teacher says, well, because the brethren have told us that. I said, well, how did the brethren know that? Well, because God told them. Yeah, but on what basis do you know this? You know, well, 
you know, we, we prayed about it. And uh, so it was this runaround thing of the brethren said, therefore it's true. Okay, so I, I knew I was at a point where I knew with my mom this was not going to cut it. She didn't trust Mormon sources anymore. You had to have the page number. You had to be able to establish this some way. So I thought, mm, okay. So when I get home, mom says, well, were you able to ask in seminary about Elohim and Jehovah? No, mom. I mean, you know, the, we went another direction in class. I didn't have time to deal with that. Sorry, no. You know, and just brushed her off because I knew she wouldn't accept the answer because it was just a statement and there was no reason behind it. Okay, my brother was going to a um, Christian school. Uh, my folks overlooked the fact that it was a Christian school. Uh, he was going there because they put out a good education and he was short for his age. If he was in the public school, they were, would have moved him up a grade and he was already shorter than the kids in his grade anyways. And uh, so they kept him in the private school. Well, one night uh, they, he brings home from school uh, a thing uh, about some meetings they were going to have at the church that sponsored the school. And uh, John had earlier uh, made some reference, uh, comment about the school talking about cults. Boy, that was a wake up, you know. Cult, where'd you hear the word cult, you know? Oh, they mentioned it at school, you know. So um, in what regard, you know, well, they said Mormonism was one of those, you know. <laughs> okay, so we decided, well, <laughs> uh, my mom says, I think I better go see what the school, uh, the church that puts out the school, what they're all about. You want to go to a meeting with me? And so I thought, oh, okay, sure. So we go off to this meeting and um, big church, big congregation. There were people in that room, I'm sure, that had been praying for my family for years while my brother went to school there. And uh, if they were sitting there thinking, oh, praise God, the McGee's have come to the service and now they're going to hear the gospel, I didn't hear it. They could have said the entire service in Chinese. I did not understand it. And you will find this with a lot of times bringing your friends to a Christian church. They may be touched by, with, uh, by the spirit of worship. They may be uh, impressed with Bible verses, whatever, that, that might touch them. Uh, I can almost guarantee you they probably aren't going to understand the message. Because Mormonism raises you with a different dictionary. I said this once in a meeting afterwards. A lady wanted to know where she could buy the Mormon dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have a little free paper back there called Terminology Differences. <laughs> As well, it's not literally another dictionary. Uh, but they have redefined all of the Christian words. And that's why if you talk to a Mormon very long, you soon realize you're not communicating. You know, you may have think you, thought you did, but you didn't quite get there. Uh, I had a lady come in one time that had moved to Salt Lake from the south, and her friends had warned her about, oh, moving in with those terrible Mormons, you know. And she says, I don't know what my friends were talking about because I spent the whole summer going through the book of John with my next door neighbor. We had this Bible study together and there wasn't any problem at all. And I said, okay, your Mormon friend is active Mormon? Oh yeah, she goes to the temple. I said, I cannot imagine going through the whole book of John with a Mormon and not having a problem. In fact, I can't imagine getting through the first four verses. <laughs> and <laughs> so uh, we got talking, and then she started to see that she, she had not got the clues of the difference between the Mormon understanding of God, Jesus, salvation, life, death, universe, everything. You know, it's all different. Every word has a different meaning to a Mormon. Uh, and this is one of the problems in people coming out of Mormonism, is it takes time to sort that out and to figure out What's different? Uh, what, what do the Christians mean? Uh, it is not unusual for people to come and tell me after they've been a Christian for a short time uh, to say, wow, it really is different, isn't it? You know, yes. Uh, but it takes time to figure that out because you're, you're used to hearing w one meaning and it's really another. That's why I advise people on leaving Mormonism uh, to get a modern version of the Bible. Now, if you want to go back to King James, I tell them that's fine later on. But right now, you need another version to make you rethink the wording. 
because as a Mormon, you're trained in the King James to understand those verses with a certain meaning. And if you read it in another version, it forces you to think through, did that really carry a Mormon understanding or was it just the way I'd been programmed to tie into the words? Okay, back to my story. <clears throat> um, I went to the dedication of the L.A. Temple in uh, 1956. Um, I had a problem with that, so I can't imagine I'd ever done well with the actual ceremony because the hallelujah shout was just about enough for me. Um, they, <laughs> we're all sitting in this big room in a certain part of the ceremony. We all stand up and face the east, and we all were told to bring hankies, and, and you stand up and you go, Hosanna, 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 you know, and I thought, wow, what's this, you know? Uh, so I don't think I'd have been a good candidate for the temple ceremony, but anyways, um, then, uh, so I'm asking questions through high school and seminary. And not getting anywhere, my mom's getting in trouble. She's going to Sunday school. And back in the dark ages uh, of the 50s, Mormons did not take their Bibles and scriptures to church. They do now, and I think that's an influence of the Christian community that have been converted into Mormonism used to taking their scriptures. They didn't, I mean, the teacher might, but the rank and file didn't take their scriptures. You had a Sunday school manual. And so if you needed to know more than the Sunday school manual, it showed there may have been something wrong with your spirit. Uh, because you had to check the befores and afters. See, so this, have you really prayed about this? So my mom's going to Sunday school class asking questions. And finally, uh, her and my aunt both, and finally, this guy in class got so frustrated, he just stood up and shook his finger at my mom and my aunt and said, only an adulterous nation seeks after a sign. And, and in essence, that means shut up, you know. Uh, so uh, they quit going to that class. And uh, they found out they had an investigator's class in our ward. The missionaries were stationed in ours. And uh, so they had an investigator's class. So my aunt and my mom start going to that. Well, they're asking all these questions, you know. Uh, and so finally the bishop tells him, you can't go to the investigator's class. And my mom says, why? I'm investigating. I've got a lot of questions, you know. <laughs> and they say, it's for non-members. You're already a member. You can't go there. Well, they'd already gotten in trouble in gospel doctrine class. So uh, uh, they didn't want to go to, they had a genealogy class, I think. And they didn't want to go there. So I think that kind of put the kibosh on Sunday school for them. But I was faithful, I was going. I went to, they opened the church door, I was there. <clears throat> okay, so then uh, I graduated from seminary in the 11th grade and started Institute of Religion, first, uh, which is their Mormons college religion classes. First year of Institute, uh, where I was just taking night classes. Um, I just found it interesting and uh, didn't have any particular problems. But the second year of Institute, uh, different thing. I don't even remember what the course was that year, but different things started coming up that would bring up things my mom had brought up. And so I started asking questions. Well, what about that? Well, just how does that work out? Well, how did you know that, you know, and how do you put that together? So finally the teacher says, Sandra, I need to talk to you after class. So I stayed after class, and he says, we have a girl investigating the church that comes to the class, and you're disturbing her with your questions. So you've got to quit asking them. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, this, uh, you know, my seminary teacher, she was a nice lady, but she was just a second grade teacher. And so, you know, I could understand that, that uh, she wouldn't want me to bring this stuff up, but this guy's trained at BYU. So if you don't ask it here, where would you ask it? You know, zip. Well, it was at this point that uh, God kind of jerked me up out of the Mormon world. <clears throat> My grandma, who had been down visiting us, asked me if I would go back with her on the bus as she went back to Salt Lake. I had a boyfriend at BYU, and I thought, great, I'll have a chance to remind him what I look at, look like, because I'm afraid he's looking at the girls up there, you know. And, and he was, see, so. Um, 
So I got up there and uh, we ended up breaking up. Uh, but my, gra my grandma's going through her mail and she has this note about some kind of meeting. And she says, will you take me to this meeting? And I says, well, what kind of meeting is it, Grandma? And she says, well, it's sort of like a Mormon fireside. Now, you'd have to know my grandma to realize how quick you would pick up on the word sort of. <laughs> uh, when she was at our house, and on uh, Saturday morning, she would ask you, are you planning on going out today? See, that's a loaded question. And you don't know whether you want to be going out or not. <laughs> Because if you're going out, she may have a whole list of things she wants to do shopping. And if you say you're staying home, she's liable to ask you to help her with the laundry or something. So, you know, it's one of those loaded questions. It's sort of like a Mormon fireside. All right, right off, this is not a Mormon fireside. Whatever it is, that's not what it is. And I couldn't get her to go and tell me anything more, but uh, <clears throat> I thought, okay. I'll take you to the meeting. Well, we drive across Salt Lake. I go up and I knock on this door, and this nice looking young man answers by the name of Gerald Tanner. And uh, the meeting looked a lot more interesting. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, wow. <laughs> okay, so I go into, and, and poor Gerald's mother, uh, she, she was so distraught that her son was having this. Uh, a semi apostate meeting in her basement. She had taken Gerald's two younger sisters out to the movie that night so they wouldn't be around to hear any of the apostasy that was going on. So I have to give you a little back upon Gerald. <clears throat> Gerald and I are both from fifth generation Mormon homes. His family had always been very devout Mormon, except that his father had gone to BYU, then went to MIT, trained as a meteorologist, not only gave up Mormonism, but gave up on God. And so Gerald grew up in a home where the father ridiculed religion and the mother tried to bring her kids up to be good Mormons in that kind of an environment. Well, when Gerald was a teen, he started rebelling and found some Mormon kids that wanted to rebel with him. And so instead of going to priesthood meeting, they'd go out behind the ward house and smoke. And uh, so this was all Mormon kids. It wasn't like he was seeking out non-Mormon friends. I mean, <laughs> in, in Utah, there's a lot of uh, Jack Mormons or not practicing Mormons, and you'll find a lot of them really, really still believe it. It doesn't matter, you know. <clears throat> I had a friend that argued with somebody in a bar about Mormonism and got his nose broke. <laughs> and uh, I said, hey, there's nothing worse than arguing with a drunk Mormon, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways. So uh, Gerald gets to the ripe old age of 18, and the bishop's making little references of getting time for that mission, you know. Back in the dark ages, uh, they used to send kids on missions to reform them. And that's why in recent years, we've heard a lot more sermons from the church leaders about send us quality missionaries, because all the parents thought this was the cure, you know. <laughs> My kids chasing around with girls and drinking and smoking, or whatever. well, send them on a mission and straighten them out, you know. Uh, I, as a teenager, I'd see different ones of my friends called on mission, and I'd, I'd gasp. But who? <laughs> Are you sure we're talking about the same fellow? <clears throat> Anyways, so it's time for Gerald's mission. And he thinks, wow, I, you know, I, I need to pay a little more attention and check this thing out a little more. So he decides he'll read the Book of Mormon. And he reads it through and says, well, yeah, that sounds good. He can believe the Book of Mormon. And then he read the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, article on Mormonism, and it mentioned there were breakoff groups of Mormons. Well, he didn't know there were any other kinds, any splinter groups or anything, and he read about the reorganized church. So he goes to his mom and asks about this, and his mom is horrified. Oh, we don't ever talk about those other guys. They're all apostates. They're evil. They teach falsehoods. Mm, you know, and so now he's curious. <laughs> like, like any rebellious teen, uh, being told he shouldn't look into these things, um, he looked in the phone book and found out there was a reorganized church in Salt Lake. So he went over to visit and talk with the pastor. And the pastor was so excited because he hadn't had a young guy come in from the Mormon church interested in the truth. And uh, so he started telling Gerald everything that was wrong with Utah Mormonism and why he needed to scrap that and go back to the real Mormon church, the reorganized LDS church 
uh, headquartered in Independence, Missouri. He started Ger telling Gerald about how Brigham Young invented polygamy. Joseph Smith never lived that. He didn't teach that. Brigham Young taught all kind of crazy things. And so he's loading Gerald down with all these references of crazy, crazy things the Mormons did out in Utah and trying to tell him that, uh, but before they came out west, it was all true. Well, uh, Gerald met another man at the reorganized church that was also studying church history. And uh, he started sharing with Gerald what he knew about early Mormon history and told him, well, there, actually, there's a number of different groups that claim Joseph is their prophet that have different belief structures. And he started telling him about different ones. Uh, so Gerald made a trip in his jalopy. It must have scared his folks to death. Uh, and drove out to Independence, Missouri. He didn't know anybody there. He just drives out and visits the different splinter groups. Now, he wasn't interested in the polygamous groups that were in Salt Lake. I mean, there were those in Salt Lake, but he, he was looking for these earlier ones that might be the true beginnings of Mormonism. And in the process of visiting this, these different churches, he runs across one little group that believed the Bible and the Book of Mormon and nothing else. They had decided and seen that Joseph Smith had changed his doctrines, changed his revelations, uh, and that uh, if you took just the Bible and the Book of Mormon, you would find out about Christ, uh, but you need to get rid of the other stuff. Everything after the Book of Mormon was scrap. So Gerald falls in with this group and starts studying with them. So this meeting I'm at, this is what's going on. He's telling everyone about what he's been finding out. Scrap Brigham Young. In fact, scrap Joseph Smith as far as the Mormon church is concerned. That's all nonsense. Just go back to the Bible and Book of Mormon and just follow Jesus, and that's where the whole thing is at. Okay, now remember, Gerald was cute. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the operative word here. So after the meeting, <laughs> every good Mormon girl knows uh, how to zero in on a guy. So. I go up and I said, oh, that was so interesting. Why don't you go over to my grandma's and tell me some more? <laughs> and uh, uh, so he comes over to my grandma's and he's got all these books with him. And I thought, oh, we're really going to talk religion all night, you know, uh, which we did. And, um, hey, you know, it really ruins your ego. Uh, but anyways. So he starts uh, telling me all about how Joseph had changed his revelations, doctrines, and all this stuff. And then uh, my grandma was there, and she came in, and we were talking with her, and she says, well, you realize, of course, you know, I was married to uh, Brigham Young's grandson, and Sandra is a direct descendant of Brigham Young. Oh, really? <laughs> and he says to me, have you ever read any of Brigham Young's sermons? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, well, would you read a few if I brought them over? And I'm thinking, well, there aren't too many of them. <laughs> and so he comes over with several volumes of the Journal of Discourses. <laughs> and he has these little tabs in them, you know. And he says, these are Brigham Young's most famous sermons. So I don't expect you to read the whole book. Just as a descendant, you owe it to yourself to read his most famous sermons. Well, you know, that sounds like pretty fair. Okay, so here's a sermon on the only men who become gods are polygamous. Well, they aren't teaching that today. Uh, will we give up polygamy for statehood? No. Well, that one didn't work out. And then another sermon, uh, will the Civil War free the slave? No. Well, that didn't work out either. And uh, Adam is our father and our God. I thought, wow, okay, you don't hear that in Sunday school today. And, but the, the thing that really hit me was when he got to Brigham Young's blood atonement doctrine. Now, in Mormonism, blood atonement is not about Christ's atonement. It's about your personal atonement. If you went through the temple and then did certain sins, that your own blood would have to be shed in order for you to have an atonement for your sin. So, I can tell you the exact sermon that finished Mormonism for me, and this is it. 1856, Brigham Young, volume three, page 247. Let me suppose a case. Suppose you found your brother in bed with your wife and put a javelin through both of them. You would be justified and they would atone for their sins and be received into the kingdom of God. 
I would at once do so in such a case and under such circumstances. I have no wife whom I love so well that I would not put a javelin through her heart and I would do it with plain hands. Further, same sermon. There is not a man or woman who violates their covenants made with their God that will not be required to pay the debt. The blood of Christ will never wipe that out. Your own blood must atone for it. Okay. There is no way that can hit you like it did me. Because I was raised to think Brigham Young practically walked on water. I grew up with stories of how Salt Lake was divinely revealed. All the streets are laid out because Brigham saw it in a vision. The tabernacle was built because he saw it in a vision. The temple was drawn up the way it is because he saw it in a vision. Everything in Salt Lake is the work of this man of God. And I'm reading this sermon and I'm thinking, God didn't tell him to preach this sermon. I've read enough of the New Testament that I knew this didn't sound like Jesus. And so I said to Gerald, whoa, okay, I'm ready to read and study whatever you're talking about, because obviously we have really big problems. So Gerald and I started studying together, and he told me about the changes in the Doctrine and Covenants in Joseph's Revelations. And I went down to the bookstore and bought a reprint of the first printing of Joseph Smith's Revelations and the current one, and I got my grandma to sit down and read with me. Day after day, we went through the Book of Commandments and marked in the Doctrine and Covenants all the places where the words were different. This accomplished two things. First, I'd never really read the Doctrine and Covenants through, and I found some of it kind of corny, uh, and that's a whole other story. But uh, the changes were really bothersome because they were meaningful changes. One revelation said the only gift God had given Joseph was to bring out the Book of Mormon, and then later it was changed to say it was just his first gift. And there were meaningful changes in his revelations. Well, I grew up on this idea the Bible had been changed so much it's not reliable. We have scriptures direct from God, so we can trust that. You just can't trust the Bible. And yet, as I went through this study with my grandma, I realized, no, it's the Mormon scriptures that have been changed. How can you have confidence that this is what God said if you can go back a few years later and rewrite it to have different teachings and different meanings? And so Gerald and I started studying together. Our courtship amount, this was our courtship. Was, it was, I mean, he, did, he took me to dinner one time uh, for a spaghetti dinner. I mean, other, uh, my courtship was every time we could get together, he was going to school at the time, when we could get together studying Mormonism. We'd get out all the books and compare notes and all this stuff. So it was, it was a little different. Uh, <laughs> uh, but remember, he was cute. You know, I mean, this is, <laughs> it helps a lot, you know. Okay, so we have this whirlwind romance, and uh, I only knew Gerald for two and a half months when we got married. Not uh, something I would advocate. Uh, <laughs> boy, did we have a lot of adjustments, but um, it, I mean, everybody grows up in different families with different assumptions, you know, and we hadn't had time to figure any of that out yet. Uh, but he was cute. But he was cute, you know. <laughs> However, that only carries you along so far, and uh, as the trash was piling up in the kitchen uh, after our first week of marriage, uh, I says, gee, the trash really needs taken out, and he says, yeah. <laughs> I said, uh, well, are you going to take it out? And he says, that's women's work. Uh, <laughs> evidently, there's a few things we need to talk about. <laughs> And thus started our 47-year struggle over who takes out the trash. <laughs> <clears throat> My family was very uh, upset that I was marrying an apostate. Uh, they were upset that I was uh, having a Protestant minister marry us. I mean, I wasn't a Christian yet. I just knew Mormonism wasn't it. And I knew I didn't want a temple marriage, but I didn't know what I believed. Gerald had become a Christian, but he still hung up with the Book of Mormon. He's only part way out of Mormonism at this point. And um, so anyways, we have this minister, Marius. Now, my mom had started a lot of this for me, but she was horrified. Because you cannot believe it and be okay. You can even go out and, and become an alcoholic and be okay, as long as you stayed in the church. 
But when you leave the church, it's, uh, it's breaking that family tie. It's uh, stepping out of the culture. It's saying there's something wrong with all of them. And uh, because you had to leave that for something that was true, it's an uh, indication that what they believe is false. And so it just raised all kind of problems with the families over this, even though I was trying to be very careful what I said. Um, it, it, just the fact that oh, I was married an apostate was enough to uh, cause all kind of problems. So after we got married, we started visiting around different Christian churches. We lived down in Southern California the first year of our marriage. And uh, ministers would come over and meet with us after we visited their church, and they'd find out that we were, used to be Mormons. And, oh, they go, oh, that's really great, you know. And then we'd say, yeah, we still believe the Book of Mormon. And they'd just be like, what? Uh, <laughs> and they wouldn't know what to say or do, because at that time there were no ministers in our area that knew anything about Mormonism other than it wasn't real Christianity, but they couldn't talk to us about it. Okay, so uh, after we've been married a few months, I'm listening to Christian radio one day, and this minister comes on, and he's preaching from 1 John chapter 4. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son as a propitiation for our sins. And as he preached on that chapter, it was like turning a telescope. And all the things I'd heard at these churches, all the things Gerald had been trying to talk to me about God and Christ and salvation all came into focus as this man explained, we love God because he first loved us. And I mean, wow, coming from a Mormon perspective, Heavenly Father, uh, I'm part of the family of God, I'm a God in embryo, I'm this good person that's just striving to do better. And as I listened to him, I realized no, I'm a sinner. I've fallen short. Uh, I have nothing to boast of in myself before God. Uh, and so as I'm listening to him, I realize, wow, uh, it really is something that God loved me first. He loved me while I was still a sinner. And as I got a hold of that, I gave my heart to Christ. But I still had that Book of Mormon. Okay, so... Uh, we moved back to Salt Lake uh, to do research on Mormonism so we'd have access to the libraries there, the universities that had all the old Mormon research. And we started meeting different people that had come out of Mormonism and they'd say, well, why do you still hang on to that Book of Mormon? I said, well, you know, because it's the Word of God, like the Bible. And uh, so then we kept being challenged on this. We thought, well, okay, we need to get into this. So we went into a study of is there any archaeological evidence for the Book of Mormon like there is for the Bible? We studied Bible stuff, we studied Book of Mormon stuff, we studied American Indians and the Mayans and all this stuff. And after going over all this, we finally concluded there's no way the Book of Mormon could be a historical book. And so through different situations, Gerald and I both approximately the same time concluded that the Book of Mormon was not true. And we had to set it aside and just go with the Bible alone. And then it made it a little easier to find a church home, too. Uh, <laughs> um, but the day I sat in my front room and accepted Christ listening to that radio station, the problem I had was, what does it mean to have accepted Christ? What, what should I believe now that I didn't believe 10 minutes ago? I didn't know. There was no one there to talk to me about this. I just knew I wanted Christ, but I didn't know what went with that package. And it took a time to work that through. And so as you minister to Mormon people, uh, there is a transition for some that takes longer than for others. Everyone doesn't move at the same pace. Everyone doesn't see all the falsehood at once. And it's just like if you were a missionary to some foreign land where there was animism or um, any kind of pagan belief or something, you would find that it would take time for those people to give up on all the traditions of that culture. It takes time to learn Christianity. And so we were working through this, but it took us a couple of years after becoming Christians to give up the Book of Mormon. Through that all, our families and friends were all saying, uh, well, you can be a Christian and be a Mormon. What's the big deal? Why leave? You know? No, it's not the same. So that's how we got into writing and printing. 
it was first for our families to tell them why we couldn't believe Mormonism anymore. And we'd give them some references on something, and like Adam God or plural marriage or something, and they'd say, oh, well, that's just two statements by Brigham Young. What difference does that make, you know? Okay, I'll get you 20. Is that sufficient, you know? And so that's why our Mormonism book is so big, uh, because we were going to bury this argument of that's just one quote. Yeah, you know, this is the way it happened, folks, and you can't hide from it. So we started printing and publishing, and we've been doing it ever since. My husband died five years ago from Alzheimer's. Uh, and when I first became a Christian and uh, tried to talk with my father about the Lord, my folks did later in their, uh, before they died, became Christians, but uh, my dad was an uh, inactive, true believing Mormon. And um, so I would talk to him about the Lord and I was telling him how Christ is sufficient for everything. All your needs, you don't need to worry about family, job, or whatever. You know, just you trust the Lord and he'll see you through that. Whatever comes into your life, he's sufficient. You don't need priesthood and temple and all this other stuff. And my dad's response was, you aren't old enough to say that. You haven't seen enough life to know that God is sufficient. And there was a little bit of truth of that. I mean, you know, what does a young kid know? Uh, to, I mean, in life experience, to say God can be there for every situation for you. Okay, well, after all these years, I can say after taking care of Gerald through the years of Alzheimer's, which got very hard, the last year Gerald was in diapers, had to be hand-fed, um, it was a very hard time. But I can tell you, God was there. God took us through. Gerald was the sweetest person in the world to take care of. Uh, so if my father were alive today, I could tell him, now I can say, God really is sufficient. He can take you through whatever is in your future. He is trustworthy. It doesn't mean we won't have the problems, but God gives us sufficient to go through whatever is ahead of us. Uh, and I just thank God for his grace that he poured out on me when I, when I didn't even know I needed him. I wasn't really even looking for him. And God just pulled me out of uh, California and dropped me on Gerald's doorstep. So, you know, uh, you have to trust that God is working in your family and friends' lives. We may not always see it. But we have to trust that he is working, and those prayers and things that we are saying for them will have an effect. Just like people that prayed for my family, I'm sure, when my brother was in that little Christian school. I'm sure people prayed for us then. Uh, and, and years later, my folks did come to faith in Christ. My sister did. My brother hasn't yet. Um, Gerald's two younger sisters came to faith in Christ. His older sister died buried in her Mormon temple clothing. Uh, but we've had a lot of aunts and uncles, a lot of cousins that have come out and become Christians. And we just praise God that by his grace, we are saved. Thank you.